Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. I think companies are making a huge mistake by creating a one-size-fits-all policy with saying you have to be in the office X amount per week. So who is Rina Hallstrom? Strom? I, you know what? Asking that question over and over again by myself as well. Who am I? <laughs> uh, and, and almost always um, getting to new answers. But let me just kind of give you a little overview of, of who I think I am. So oh, my name, name is Rina Hellström. I am a mm. Finnish Agile Enterprise Coach and an organizational developer. Uh, and I've been working with organizations or people systems, if you may, for mm -hmm. 20 plus years. So I've been working with so many different ways and so many different things with org change, with organizational design, with management structures, with strategies and strategy mm -hmm. adoption with everything you can imagine in HR, apart from a couple of things um, which I haven't done, and then worked with Agile quite a lot as well. So the last mm -hmm. 11 years, I have been focusing on what Agile brings to the management side, the org development side, the org design side, and to HR. And then I work quite a lot with non-IT professionals, so trying to mm -hmm. help people understand what this means in their own domain. So that's me. Privately, I, I live in Finland. I work globally, especially now with the what happened with the COVID. Our business is all over the world, starting in the morning with Australia, ending uh, <laughs> with the US in the evening. So it's a lot of work currently, which I love. And then privately, I've got two kids and a summer home and on an island where we are aiming to be today uh, or this, this summer as well for a while. So that's nice. what I do in the spare time. And I love traveling, but right now, one and a half years, I haven't been able to do that privately. So I'm hoping that the world will be opening up soon. Where do you want to go once uh, things open up? I would up like to go to Japan. I haven't, yeah. I, I love getting touched by new cultures and new mm -hmm. ways of thinking, new languages. And I haven't experienced Japan yet. So that's mm -hmm. something that I would like to experience. And then I have a couple of things on my bucket list, like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and then again, South America. I just loved South America mm -hmm. and the vibe there. It's very different from our organized Protestantic <laughs> Finland to go yeah. to South America where things like, you know, manana and maybe it happens and maybe it doesn't. And let's take it easy and let's have a mango and yeah. beer. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. I was talking to my wife too. And like, we usually, it's like, travel between United States and Europe and you know it, it's uh some of those places especially you know Australia we have a lot of relatives there and it's it's interesting so I think it's uh everybody I talk to these days everybody's eager to go back to traveling so uh but to bring us back to uh HR and agile there's a lot of we hear a lot about agile in HR agile HR um, mm -hmm. What does it actually mean and why is it becoming increasingly important? Uh, you wrote a book on it or you co-authored a book on Agile HR. So what is it and why is it important? So let me take you back to 11 years ago when I was mm -hmm. working in organizations within HR and management development. I was continuously challenging how we were treating people. Mm -hmm. how we were setting up people practices and trying to support them to do a good job. But they were basically just, I mean, the, the way how organizations are set up are very machine-like. It's like the taken from the engineering practices and processes, practices, standardiz standardizations, this is how things should work. And I was challenging that. Might be because of my background in team sports. I've been playing handball for 18 years in my life. And then uh, might be in my background also in organic chemistry and organic, you know, pharmaceuticals and how the body works, et cetera. So there's a lot of different kind of thinking from that organic side. And I was looking at organizations said, you know what, this doesn't make sense. We've got brilliant people here. They are so they've got so much potential, but they're just bringing a fraction of it to work because our system doesn't allow them to work together very well. 
So I was always challenging this. And I was looking for something that would, I was kind of trying to make up a system in my head, like how can we bring the biggest potential? How can teams start really working together? I was thinking that we don't need that much managers. We might need some coaches to bring the best out of people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then I came across the Scrum Guide, which practically changed my life. Because when I, when I read that, I was like, yes, somebody has described <laughs> yeah. a, a system of work which mm -hmm. I believe in, which sounds like organic. It sounds like people can bring their potential. It sounds like we're continuously learning and adapting to the um, ongoing environmental changes, needing mm -hmm. to adapt to requirement changes, et cetera. And I saw that, you know what, this is not just happening in software or IT. Mm -hmm. This is happening everywhere. And that, that kind of hit my kind of, um, I just blew my mind that, you know what, this is going to spread from software to every, everywhere, everywhere mm -hmm. else as well. Then I started learning about this and I started connecting with people like you uh, who mm -hmm. are kind of long term gurus in agile from the software and IT side. And the people said to me, you know what, what are you doing here? We don't want HR even close to what we're doing because you're ruining everything for us. <laughs> and I went like, you know what? Uh, you just wait, because when you start scaling this across your organization, when you start scaling agile teams and they need to start working together and you might have 100 people working this way, that's when you need to start, start to knock on my door in HR, because we're caring for the people system. We're caring for org design. We, we might be caring for how we develop managers long term or leadership. Mm -hmm. We are caring for performance management structures, for rewarding, for the policies of how to work, how to recruit, how to um, hire and fire people, what kind of learning you know, processes and practices you've got in this organization. So all of that people back end, mm -hmm. that's what HR is working with. And that's why Agile HR is important. So some people say, oh, this is just a fad and you've got just taking a Agile from software and using it in HR. You know what? Yeah, I am because we've got a lot to learn from you people. We need yeah. to start uh, adopting the ways of working here as well to be able to create people practices that work for Agile organizations. We have to be Agile ourselves and start co-creating with people, start understanding what works, only delivering out people practices that work with the teams. So there's a lot in Agile HR. We talk about two things, Agile HR or Agile in HR. So how can we in HR or people operations start using the Agile practices to deliver mm -hmm. value out to our employees, to the managers, to the businesses? And on the other hand, HR for Agile, which means that what kind of people practices, people policies, people solutions and products do we need to build to enable modern organizations, uh, networked, flexible, agile organizations. Mm -hmm. So these are two sides of agile HR, which, which I tend to bring up. Yeah, so maybe let's explore um, one of those. So like when it comes to uh, helping and, uh, you know, HR driving and helping with org transformation and design, uh, in what ways could HR help? with org design and, and transformations and these initiatives that are company-wide that encompass the entire organization and impact every piece of the organization. So it depends a bit, in my opinion, on the context. When we talk it always about, does, right? Context yeah, is yeah. the most. <laughs> exactly. And when we talk about transformations, first of all, what kind of a company is transforming? If it's the traditional classic management structure where you've got the line organization, where you've got the annual budget, you've got the product manage, project management, you've got that kind of structure, and you start gradually bringing people on board to an agile structure, setting up agile teams, maybe finding an end-to-end -end value stream where you start a scale model, where you start a little bit of Kanban here, start using Scrum in certain teams, in those kind of situations, HR can work with so many different things. First of all, capability build. Uh, so who is sitting on the learning and development is usually HR. And they need to start building the capabilities at least half a year, if not a year ahead, so that you've got product owners coming in and scrum masters coming in. And you've got people who understand agile on the business side. So that's one part. Another part is the org design, because quite I would say, um, how would I say this without being too cynical? Well, uh, uh, big 
big consultancies coming in and selling big transformations usually come in with a model. Here is a perfect model for you. And here is, this is how you should implement Agile. And I don't believe that because I've been working with so many organizational changes that you just can't implement or change, especially with Agile. You have to invite people in, you have to co-create with them and bring them along to a journey, which is an evolution, not an implementation. So when you start working with this, we in HR have seen quite many changes and we might be able to help with that um, staging and creating a roadmap of what to do next and what to remember mm -hmm. to do regarding people practices, uh, enablers such as rewarding and performance structures, um, leadership. So where I see quite a lot of transformations go wrong or have trouble is when we have this, we keep the same line management structure mm -hmm. in the agile structure, right? And we don't need the same kind of line managers there. What we need is different kind of enablers and adapt, um, um, people who align the teams, who work with impediments, who work with improvement of the system. We don't need that, mm -hmm. how would I say, maybe um, delegating, micromanaging, reporting, um, accountable line manager there. And mm -hmm. to start changing the structure of management, that's also something that HR works with. Where do so, we so find? that's a lot so that's a lot about like decentralizing what you're describing is like how the context matters but assuming that we're working where you know that type of like you know command and control or maybe not necessarily command and control but more of a uh you know one person accountable for everything versus uh, uh sharing that responsibility uh is correct. that what you're talking about yeah. correct correct i mean it is a lot about decentralizing what makes sense mm -hmm. but then understanding what where it makes sense to have central services available for example mm -hmm. if we talk about people services i don't think that each team should be professionals in talent acquisition and recruiting mm -hmm. i think that there should be a service where we've got you know shortlisted people two teams and saying hey we know that you're looking for an arm you know software developer back-end software developer here are the talents that we've scanned from our from our you know databases from our network they who have applied look at these uh, candidates and come back to us and see what you want to do with them rather than have them do the kind of dirty work of recruitment or the kind of operational work so there's a lot of thinking here and there is not one way of doing this there is not one model but we have to continuously think about what's best for the organization how much work we can put on the teams as well and how much decision making they're ready to take on i'll give you an example just to be clear because it's much easier to, to actually talk by examples mm -hmm. i was working with a transformation business transformation where we transformed um, a unit with 550 people towards a uh, kind of a team of teams model so it wasn't any of these agile scale model that we are used to, but the team of teams model, self-organized teams who were there to sync together on how to work. Consultancy, um, IT consultancy, they are competing with the best agile, very innovative companies. And we started onboarding people onto, onto this model. And uh, then uh, we've onboarded about 200 people onto self-organized model. And the mm -hmm. team started realizing that they've got different maturity levels of making these decisions themselves. Some teams were not quite there yet to make pricing decisions or to make decisions about which uh, leads were kind of okay to start working with. Because if you started working with a lead, it was a lot of work that went into getting all the way to a suggestion or, uh, you know. So mm -hmm. we, instead of, of having a manager there to make these decisions, what we came up with and what the managers themselves came up with is that they created a team of leaders who offered services to these teams. So mm -hmm. leadership as a service. And they say, here, we can help with pricing. We can help you with, you know, um, agreeing on if, if a lead is qualified or not. We can help you with problems in the team. We can help you with, you know, retrospectives. We can help you with impediments around the organization. So these mm -hmm. are our services for you as teams to be able to do a good job. And I think that was just brilliant again rethinking on on how we can support the system and help that evolve 
rather than creating some kind of a, a, an addi- additional process or additional yeah. role to take in in each role in each and team. that's what it yeah and that's what it sounds like it's almost the uh, and i've seen this and I, I agree in the sense of like trying to go prescriptive but like this is more organic you create some guardrails and you say self-organize around this in, a, in this instance it's a policy right would you call that a policy i would call no it process i would call it a ongoing service that needs to kind of be it's kind of an in-house consultancy basically Mm -hmm. but then if i talk about process or policy i had this is another example but when we are in hr we have Mm -hmm. two things that we need to take care of at least first of all supporting the organization to do its best possible job and be healthy you know Mm -hmm. that's one thing second of all every country has legal compliance Regarding employment laws, regarding corporate laws, what we we need to take care of with employees, health, well-being, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And you're not a professional in corporate employment legislation. Even if you're a master of agile enterprise, whatever, you don't know what the law is in France or Russia or US or whatever. But we've got the network to understand what we can do there and what we can't do there and how we need to support the organization within those constraints. So that's something that we'll need to, you know, we still need to have policies there. And I had a transformation where this executive agile, I was a CHRO there. One of the agile coaches came to say, hey, we've got a great idea. We are now so self-organized, so we're not going to report or record any work time anymore uh, because everybody can take care of themselves. And I was like, that's a great idea, but let's let's just kind of take a step back, a couple of steps back here, (laughs) because that is a massive risk. And that risk is a risk that the company can't take because there is legislation in place. If we can't show the authorities how much you work, we are going to be in court and shut down very quickly so that you don't work overtime without pay or overtime. So we're killing you with work, you know, so mm-hmm. or that you were overburdening yourself too much with too much work. So we can't do that. And sometimes when you have to be the bad police, bad cop still and say, hey, mm-hmm. fantastic idea. But let's look at the constraints in a similar way as you in in software are looking at, for example, privacy or or security discussions you've got certain Mm -hmm. guardrails which you just need to keep and that's the Mm -hmm. same thing with the people practices every country additionally has different kind of legislation so it's not that Mm -hmm. easy to create fair systems that work in each country and that's the back end that we know quite a lot about does that make sense it does no and i'm just thinking you know in the sense of like you know changing those uh you know policies that are related to design and one of them that comes up a lot is obviously the whole compensation and uh that's related to that is performance reviews right a lot of yes times. so uh from your perspective and understanding the traditional way of performance reviews what does it look like in an agile context or in a complex context how do we reward people how do we do um uh, you know some type of assessments or or uh you know what, what replaces what annual what, what replaces just... annual reviews <laughs> <laughs> aren't you aren't you in for that once a year discussion with your manager about how you did the whole you know it's as absurd as i i would be your spouse and i would have one conversation with you a year telling you <laughs> that you know Lilian, last year you did you're a three from last year you're a three out of five from the whole year from all situations you know it's as ridiculous so let's start looking into this to make this uh, uh, comparison even a little bit more crazy or funnier, if you had five husbands, you couldn't, and they all performed great, you couldn't also <laughs> you rate them as fives, five. right? <laughs> so that, exactly. there's something fundamentally wrong with that, uh, with that approach. So what do we do in Agile? Like, so or first in, of all, uh, let, let's understand. I think that we need to go back to some principles. Why do we have performance management structure in place altogether? What value Mm -hmm. are they there to drive? Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the value, it's not actually the value shouldn't be about looking in the review mirror and evaluating what you did. The value should be in helping you succeed as you go forward, because that's the thing that we can still impact, right? 
Mm -hmm. So I would like us to start thinking about performance management as in growth conversations, as in looking forward, as in improving. And again, as in target setting and knowing where we're going, even if the target would be, if we, if we would, even if we would need to pivot a little bit, the targets there, we, we are aligned on where we're going so that we can self-organize around that. Now, easier said than done. Uh, the large corporations have performance management structures that are agreed all the way up in the board. So changing them takes at least one year, if not two years, to really start redesigning a performance management structure. Takes a long time, not done in a you know, blink of an eye. Second of all, um, if we can't change that big thing immediately, what I usually have recommended is, okay, let's tweak it a little bit. Let's at least get rid of individual target setting. Because if you've got an individual target for a person working in a scrum team or agile team, and they are set for, for a year, and even if that agile team needs to pivot or even leave the value delivery because it doesn't make sense, this per, these persons might be conflicted with their target versus what's the best thing to do. So let's give uh, people at least a team target, if not a value delivery target towards the customer where we've got several teams connected to the same value delivery. Let's Try, uh, remembering when we build performance management structures, uh, we have a saying in Finland, if you bow to one, one side, you show your back end to another side. I'm not sure <laughs> if you have that saying, you know? So yeah. rewarding practices are the same. You always sub-optimize something. If you've got a team level practice, you might sub-optimize the unit uh, profitability. If you've got a high level uh, target setting, say that everybody's rewarding are connected to a high level target, you feel that, okay, but I don't have that much to say. I can't influence that that much. It's not motivating me. So now we come to the motivating point. Do we need these targets and rewarding connected? Quite a lot of companies are decoupling the target setting from the rewarding. Oh, yeah. So rewarding is maybe connected to profitability or growth or new customer you know, recognition. So the KPI is what the value delivery is there for. Mm -hmm. And the targets are set maybe quarterly uh, mm -hmm. where we quarterly are looking at, into how can we get towards this big ambitious goal? What do we do there? And the targets are then discussed. How did we get towards them? How did we do? How did we, you know, how can we improve? And I hearing me use the word we continuously. Mm -hmm. It is about we. It's about mm -hmm. how do we go there. And now I think we could have different kind of levels of performance management as well, performance uh, kind of uh, influence. The third thing I want to say about this is that, which many people haven't really maybe kind of broken down into bits and pieces, but the agile system is a performance management system. I'm going to say that again, this is so important. The agile structure includes everything that a performance management, the traditional performance management structure included. It includes setting a big vision. It includes a goal, the KPIs of what we're building, what the value delivery is. It includes breaking that goal down into attainable epics or features or bits and pieces that we're building. It includes continuous evaluation of those pieces and setting targets on a micro level, right? We're setting targets for each, I don't know, quarter or sprint or whatever you're using. We've got the, what we know what we're aiming for in teams. It includes evaluation of those targets together as a team. How are we doing? Are we delivering what we should? So it's the evaluation is there as well. And it includes improvement. So how can we improve as a team or as a unit or as a mm -hmm. whatever bigger size? So it includes all of those elements. What it doesn't include specifically is what we tend to have in the performance management structure as well is the learning and development. So how do we mm -hmm. add to growing our capabilities and skills? But that can be added as well. So why do we need an extra layer of performance management on top of agile, which includes all of this is a good mm -hmm. question as well. Can we just yeah. pay people enough to bring their best to work, to do their best with the potential they have um, in, you know, in comparison to maybe the field overall, and then mm -hmm. skip that circus of performance management. That, that's yeah. one question I have. Yeah, it's, I think that's what you know, we're going to see you know, over the last five years, 10 years, Agile HR has slowly been brewing. But I think over the next five to 10 years, we're going to see more organizations trying to figure this out. And like we said, 
I don't think there is a specific way of doing it. You have to figure it out uh, based on your context. What are some of the companies out there that you admire? Um, maybe that you work with or you've heard of, like uh, what are they doing um, that are kind of the forefront of uh, um, this kind Agile, of change? Agile HR? Yeah. I do. I, I have to say, I do like Spotify's HR and, and Spotify sharing of their agile practices and how, how mm -hmm. they are working with hacking their sales forward and, and, and growing the mm -hmm. understanding and co-creating with the organization. I, I do like that very much. I also appreciate we've got some fantastic case studies in the agile HR community that are also shared in, in our network um, where People who are learning this are starting to, for example, use design thinking in delivering mm -hmm. people products in-house. So if we take an example, they want to develop an awesome remote onboarding practice. Instead of us going with HR people into a bunker, designing the onboarding practice and then, you know, releasing that to you and saying, hey, here is we implement this, we would take you in and say, hey, you know, a couple of people who's been recently onboarded, a couple of managers, maybe some candidates and say, let's now innovate on how to create awesome remote onboarding practices. They would use design mm -hmm. thinking in validating, testing small scale what works and what doesn't. And then when they find something that works in their context and their company with the candidates and with the people mm -hmm. who they are onboarding, they would maybe then adopt a couple of different ones, a couple of different remote onboarding practices. So this is what we are seeing across the scale with people in HR who learn this way of thinking. They mm -hmm. don't think there is one size fits all. They don't think that they can come up with the solution themselves. They start developing with the organization. Mm -hmm. And there are some amazing stuff uh, coming out, such as um, I know that I can't mention the, some of the customers' names because we've got very strict NDAs. So let me say this. A very prominent tech company um, delivering technology and, and entertainment to many of the people in the world are right now building in inclusion in everything they're doing. And that's also done through testing, evaluating, discussing with the company all, all over so that it's part of what we do. It's not something additional added on to, you know, everything we do. Exactly. So, so there's, there's great things going on. And it's not about who does what. It's about how we think of delivering these things to the employees, to the managers, to the leaders. Mm -hmm. We don't, we stop with this, you know, going into product development stage for a year and then coming up with something which is old, not liked, not validated. We are, we are talking about having a pilot test group, but all the assumptions yeah. have been built into the product anyway, you know, in that stage. <laughs> so. so you're anchoring, yeah. Um, so, so that's very interesting because it kind of like that's what we're dealing with, the, you know, agile. And, and I know in your book, you, you talk about mindset, but could you maybe just elaborate? Like it's a mindset shift. Uh, massive, uh, that, massive. Yeah. And that's easier mm. said than done. Um, especially well, for <laughs> may I may I kind of ask you another question back? What's mm. your typical viewpoint of agile? Sorry, sort of HR people. What is how would you describe this as a HR person? It's somebody that's responsible for the you know HR stuff, with performance, jobs, hiring. Um, you know, somebody that works with senior leaders on defining maybe culture. You know, in a sense, they're responsible, uh, like you said earlier, like maybe health of the organization uh, in general. Um, but, I, you know, one thing that probably stands, they're like far away, right? Mm. They, they're mm. not engaged and they tell us what to do. And I think uh, that's what a lot of people feel like, because I've worked, you know, as a consultant, but I also work inside organizations as an employee. And that's how yeah. it feels like. And uh, for the ones that are moving more to this inclusion that you're talking about and co-creation, it feels more engaging. Yeah. You know, as an yeah. employee, you feel more engaged. So great to hear that you've got still you have quite a modern view of who HR is and what we do, because quite many people say HR, they're doing something with admin and just sending us a lot of forms and taking care <laughs> of payroll and some legal stuff, right? So they don't know that we're working with all that, what you just said, but quite many people think that HR are, and yes, 
there are different ranges of HR people. There are the more operational, more um, kind of legal background people who take care of what we need to take care of. But they're kind of, I would say, if I, if I dare to, um, what's the word in English, when you kind of give a character, ca- characterize, yeah, if I dare to characterize yeah. them quite high probability is that they are risk averse because they need mm-hmm. to take care of a lot of stuff regarding law. They are, um, they are prone to want the right, right solutions, the right answers, prepare everything to perfection and have all the answers prepared for managers and leaders because they are put in quite difficult situations quite often. So they want to be prepared and have everything done and polished and, you know, show a perfect um, solution or or product. So to start to teach these people who think this way and who have been, you know, they've been trained this way. that's, Mm -hmm. That's their dominant way of thinking. Hey, you know what? What if we would show something which is a draft? Well, what if we would show something, three mock-ups and prototypes to managers and ask for feedback? Oh my God, that's such a big mindset shift, shift even that. How can we show something which isn't ready? How can we even say that we don't know where we're going to end up? Well, how can you know something if you're working with, say, culture change? How on earth can you write an end state of culture change? You can't, yeah. my friends. Yeah. We have to just start <laughs> going in this direction, you know, as an evolution stepwise. But when we then help them understand how to do that, that what I think is the beauty with Agile is that the, the certainty doesn't come from what you do. The certainty doesn't come from a plan as it did previously. Mm-hmm. The certainty comes from the process. The certainty comes from, I know that we will have planning time coming up every month. The certainty comes from, I know that we will review together what we've done. And if it's not perfect, it's okay, because somebody, there's a high probability that somebody will pick up on the on the floors, you know, and we can mm-hmm. fix it as we go forward. That's where the certainty comes from, from the process. And when people start learning this, they are much more comfortable with starting to work in new ways, starting to show kind of, half done um, prototypes to employees, starting to bring in pr- employees to a hacking, you know, let's mm-hmm. hack the recruitment practice together. Started to be opening up to ideas and even letting people very keen to get feedback and even get people to shoot down the ideas if they're not good. Mm-hmm. Why build something in, in a scaled matter for the whole organization if five people can tell you in the beginning that this won't fly, you know? So. Exactly. And that's more like, you know, so who's responsible for engagement? Because most people in Western countries, at least based on the research, are disengaged at work. So is it HR that's responsible? Because, uh, or who is it? Maybe we're all responsible for it. But I, I, That's what I'm laughing about. I mean, that's like, yeah. who's responsible for you breathing? Who's responsible, nah. for, who's responsible for, for having good communication? Everyone mm-hmm. are. You know, we might have tools, practices, and and supporting mechanisms or services to help you um, in teams start engaging more Mm -hmm. or start evaluating your engagement or bring in some kind of budgets to do something with your growth or health or whatever. Or I think there's two sides, by the way, engagement, but enablement as well. You can be as engaged you want, but if you don't have the tools and the means to, to deliver value, that engagement will take you far. Well, what about so, this? This is a, I recently worked with a client and uh, one of the managers says, Milan, the, uh, the only way that you get promoted here and you climb up the ladder is by staying, you know, uh, 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 un, unnoticed and, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, not raising any red flags. Uh, 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 keeping it down and not essentially messing things up because eventually whoever messes up, they they filter those out. So that's not policy. That's not you know. That's I would that's assume culture. it has to be culture, right? Yeah, that's more culture. And I mean, I think that my answer is uh, choose your battles. Um, yeah. There are amazing companies that you can work for if you are okay. innovative. If you're ready to you know, bring in ideas, work with others, be engaged. And there are companies where there isn't time or space or room for that. 
-hmm. and I think choose your battles is as well. Sometimes you can actually make quite a big difference as being the innovation innovator, as being the one who is engaging others, as being the one who is always in these new initiatives, uh, but carrying the full load all the time will become mm -hmm. quite burdening. So um, yeah, it's, it's more of a cultural thing and quite a lot of companies are now talking about going agile and let's be innovative and you know everybody has a voice and mm -hmm. and blah 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 but even the most innovative companies uh, still have some structures especially if they've been around for longer than 20 years 15 20 years mm -hmm. they still have some structures there which are top down and mm -hmm. we won't get rid of those structures some top down structures are actually quite good as well so mm -hmm. i'm not fully in for um, or there are organizations where full self-organizing principles can work but when we start working working with larger structures top-down structures and organizing principles might be as well welcome for for people to bring some clarity and, and alignment etc that said mm -hmm. i think that we can go so much faster in organizations that are larger when we unleash the engagement and potential and mm -hmm. i think that I'm not sure if you agree, but when you tell people is that you can go and work with these people towards that goal, that's the goal we're aiming for. We can't tell you exactly how to go there, but you need to figure that out together. Here is, um, you know, means for you to do this, enablement, budgets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, decisions. This is how we can work with problems as, as we go along. And here are some clear red lines that you can't step over. These are mm -hmm. the constraints. You can't do this or this or this or this. That's a no-go. And I think to make bring this clarity to people, what can I do? What can't I do? And then just say, tell them, you know, run, go, find out, and, and let me know mm -hmm. how, I can, how I can support you. That's what we're trying to build. Um, and those kind of organizations, I think, will thrive in the, in the going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so too. And so what is it about like our desire to have specific frameworks? Because like everybody that I talk to, everybody's saying, you know, this kind of uh, templatized the way of like the way the frameworks are being sold, the big consulting companies are uh, 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 doing. And, you know, for if you've been in the trenches and you've been doing this, you know that there's no framework that you have to contextualize and adjust things. So why do you think organizations buy into the scaling and how do you work? Have you worked with organizations, for instance, that have adopted SAFE or one of the other frameworks? And uh, what kind of challenges do you run into when companies kind of going all in on a specific framework that might not align with? I would say I'm not... I'm not for or against any kind of frameworks. I understand most of them. I understand what's good about them and I understand their pitfalls. And I also am not naive. If you want to start changing an organization with 50,000 people, you can't just do that organically, you know, let agile bloom and, and you know, start doing something in teams and start understanding how this works. It will take too long. That's a business risk. So I've seen, um, I've seen some companies do kind of implementation of an of a one of the models which are scaling agile so scrum at scale spotify model safe less these types of models are used and it's kind of a next iteration it's kind of getting everybody to just work in a new way in a quite a quick way and mm. but they might be missing on what i think is the most important thing and I think it's the most important thing is to reach every individual who start working in a new way, in three different ways. First of all, heart, to understand what the values and the principles are behind this. Why is this a new way of working? What does it mean for me as a behavioral change when I start working in my domain or my, with my new team or with the people that are around me? What does that change in how I do my everyday life, but also how I make decisions, how I react on things, and being able to recognize that, for example, just a couple of examples. How do we deal with uh, mistakes? How do we deal with conflicts? Uh, how do we deal with impediments in this organization? Just very important questions that reveal what value level you are on. Mm -hmm. The second 
heart, the second was hands. How to quickly move from concept, you know, concepts and conceptualizing the models to let's just start trying. Mm -hmm. Here, this is how we do it. You know, let's meet, let's plan our stuff, let's visualize it up on the wall, let's start working on that. It will not be easy the first couple of sprints or couple of rounds. And let's iterate and improve. And that's the so whole that's idea. So that's the whole kind of idea of empiricism and just exactly, exactly. respect and adapt, keep it Ex transparent. Exactly. Yeah. And if there's something with the model that doesn't, if, if we talk about kind of transforming with, through models, if there's something with the model that doesn't work, raise that. We need to have a, a some kind of a team or a unit that takes up these red flags and checks, okay, this scale model is breaking down here, doesn't work mm -hmm. there let's fix this somehow let's give them the freedom to do it in a different way or let's coordinate or let's get these teams to work together because right now i see quite a lot of this thing that organizations are adopting agile some kind of a, you know safe or or another model and they kind of have it on on additionally to their line organization they just add a scale model on top of that yeah. and say you know Mina, you're now working in your usual job 100% but additionally, you're in this one train, safe train, and you're there 20%. And then you're in another safe train for 10%. And that's not even safe, my friends. I mean, that isn't the scaled agile model. That's just combining two models and just making a mess. Exactly. So, and it's like, not, I use the analogy of cooks and chefs. And it's like a bunch of cooks throwing stuff in without knowing what they're doing. And uh, this comes back to uh, the idea of learning and development. And what I run into a lot of organizations, I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Principle, uh, uh, where like people are promoted uh, to, to a position where they're not really competent for. Oh, yeah. um, uh, but like, how is learning and development uh, changing and like what types of things HR can support? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fidelity, but they, for instance, give one day a week to their developers Tuesdays. Uh, to focus on learning and developing themselves. And they don't ask them to report anything. Just said one day a week is dedicated for you to growing yourself. That's a pretty big commitment from a company to say one day a week, every week. Um, uh, I, would say, I would say there, there is no way we can centrally coordinate learning anymore. There is no way it makes sense because it would be much too slow. How it depends on how quickly people need to upskill themselves in different organizational positions or different teams. And if we talk about software de developers, how quickly do you think their skills in a coding language or something becomes obsolete? It's one in two, three, four years. So they will need to continuously upskill themselves. And if we would have some kind of a structure there where think about this, imagine that just 10 years ago, it worked this way. You had a development discussion with your leader. Then you agreed with the leader what you should learn during the next year. Yeah. Then that was you know, coordinated and gathered centrally to an HRD function who started looking at, okay, what do we need in this company? Then that was approximately, you know, you, start, you had the conversation with your manager in January or February, about by May, they got this coordinated effort. By August, they had made a plan of what people should learn the next year in the company. <laughs> then they start yeah. discussing with vendors, you know, in October. Then they have an offering next January, February, a year after you had the need of, of learning. Those skills, yeah. Yeah, and then you have the offering available. That just doesn't fly anymore. Okay, let's mm -hmm. get rid of these kind of things. What we can see in L&D happening is decentralizing of learning. Having these kind of pra practices such as use X amount of time of learning, have, have um, communities of practice or meetups in-house, bring in speakers to learn, you know, go to, to meet other in other companies to learn about this. Here is a budget for each team. You can use this budget as you wish to be able to make sure that you're going in the strategic direction with your learning. And here you might even have kind of gurus from different areas and domain areas to describe what the strategic um, learning domains are. You know, maybe artificial intelligence gurus would write, this is what's happening in this field. Maybe we've got um, designers writing what's going on in that field right now where we need to focus on. So uh, maybe you have that kind of a map guiding your, you towards something. So we start seeing much more decentralization 
and also coaching. So people and teams are being helped with the invisible. You know, mm -hmm. you might know coding, but to actually describe that to a junior level a developer and help them upskill themselves through working with you, that might need some extra help. I'm working quite a lot with engineers and, <laughs> and I'm an engineer myself, so I get to uh, say this. <laughs> engineers are not always very, very good with empathizing and expressing themselves and listening to what you really mean and understanding each other and making sure that we understand each other. So clarifying that we really know what we are talking about. They are very, very focused on facts you know, and getting that written maybe, and that's it. So here, coaching can make a massive difference. I mean, I've been coaching teams where I just go in, I have no idea what they're talking about, and that's not my thing. But I make sure that people understand that each other, that we've discussed open issues or problems or conflicts in a very, very collaborative way, in a safe structure, mm -hmm. which, I, which you and I are able to kind of create. Mm -hmm. And people feel much more comfortable than... Um, you know, the, the big, big invisible stuff is taken care of, then they can focus on just getting that technical stuff done. So exactly. there, there's a lot that's happening in that space as well. And you know what? You know who is who are very, very good coaches and very, very good scrum masters? HR people. Mm -hmm. Because we've been doing this forever. We've been working with people. We've been training. We've been facilitating. We've been listening. We are very, very good with that. So I am seeing right now HR people step in as scrum masters, step in as agile coaches, and even mm -hmm. leading business transformations because they've been leading business transformations and changes before. Now there's just the agile tab tab on. Right? <laughs> Which we add, we add the agile tab to everything. Like just yeah. throw agile on it and. Uh... But that's very interesting because I, I agree, like in a sense, like, and also teaching others how to do that yeah. same thing. And like, how do you scale coaching? Well, you know, te you teach others to to understand, to be better listeners, to, to, to uh, uh, you know, try to look for better questions, to understand people better. You know, I would hope that, you know, uh, HR people understand the human side of things. And you would think, you know, that's what, <laughs> you know, HR stands for, I hope. Um, so maybe as a last question here, um, how do you think, how has this COVID kind of impacted HR and um, both short-term and long-term? What are we going to see when it comes to this whole impact of oh, distributed workforce, question. space, like, you know, where, how we work? Um, do you have another hour? I know. <laughs> so Let's maybe whatever we can condense will, in the next eight minutes. I will. Uh, I will fix the world's COVID and HR problems <laughs> in three minutes or less. Okay, <laughs> that's a that's a challenge. No. So um, I think that what we've seen is amazing flexibility from many companies, not just companies, but people. People both who are working, employees who are working in the companies have been shown that they are worth the trust that we should be, should have been giving them in the first place. I mean, so many companies that I'm working with have been making their amazing results, getting things done with amazing speed. Uh, and people are quite burned out, to be honest, because they've been working say, yeah. so hard. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that we need to start dealing with. I mean, HR people are also very burned out. Um, it's not, you know, 10 people or 20 that I know that are so tired because they've been caring for the whole organization, the policies, the health, you know, healthcare, all of that mm -hmm. at the same time while they are also running, you know, with their families and, and you know, exactly. working from home, et cetera. So health and well-being of people is, is one thing that I think is very important. The second what's interesting is that now there is absolutely no reason to say we can't do this virtually. We can't do this mm -hmm. digitally. That's an excuse that can't be used anymore. So it has to be very deliberate. You know, where are we working? What are we doing face to face? What are mm -hmm. we doing as a hybrid model? You know, the worst thing from at least for me with training and facilitation is that some people are online and some people are in, in the room. That is a really difficult discussion and, yeah. and facilitation. Uh, so it has to be very deliberate. We need to be much more strategic in, in what should we do. And that there's, again, 
can we let the teams make this decision rather than the company policy? Mm-hmm. This, the third thing is we see two things. Preference of returning to work is very scattered. So we can't go with averages. There's um, a company called Gleesman who is doing some research where they've got some 200,000 uh, data points of if people want to return to work or not. And this mm-hmm. is about wanting to. And that's scattered. So some people say, I don't want to go back to work at all. I'm 20, 25 percent, if I remember correctly, Do, does want to just work remotely. And about the same amount want to go fully into the office. But then we've got people scattered between one to two days in the office, three to four days, you know. So there is not going to be an average approach that works for everybody. What we need to understand is that, oh, wow, our talent base just got scattered. These people who are working remotely, if we don't have a solution for them, they're going to be poached poached very easily by companies who offer a better life work experience for them, right? Exactly. Uh, so, and then, then this kind of, I think companies are making a huge mistake by creating a one size fits all policy with saying you mm-hmm. have to be in the office X amount per week. Why don't you say it will create a policy where you say every team needs to look at your context, your customers, your value, de- uh, value delivery, and agree on what you do virtually and what you do in the office. And it has to be an explicit, explicit team commitment on how mm-hmm. you work, right? So why don't we do that? Because teams can make the best decisions for sure. So that's like going from very rigid policies to more adaptive policies that are context specific. And in that instance, you're decentralizing that decision of what we, how we work to to the units and teams based on, you know, where they are maturity wise, where they are in their work. Uh, I mean, the whole context. Yeah. But what you can create as a policy is that you have to make this explicit discussion and explicit mm-hmm. choices. And, and then we come to the culture and then we come to, do you have managers who are micromanaging management professionals who don't trust people? That's another conversation again. But, you but, know, yeah. What, yeah. the other thing is that digitalization and, and if we think about the COVID is yeah. there's nothing that prepared organizations better for agile than COVID because we didn't know what, to, what kind of decisions to make. We needed to react every day last spring, uh, every week after the summer, and now maybe every month we need to make new contingency yeah. plans. You know, so it's this- a, yeah, and that, a lot of people I talked to, they're like, this was a good test in a sense of just to to open our eyes to to you know as much as negative. It's also created a lot of positive opportunities just to our whole perception of yes. what is feasible and what's not feasible. And you know what, I, the change or the, the kind of different situation was so long lasting that it has changed, mm-hmm. you know, changed behavior in a lasting way. Mm-hmm. So people have changed behavior, people have changed opinion. I thought that I can't do what I do virtually, but actually now I find out what we do at Train Agile is working yeah. much better in a virtual setting because we, we, we break that down into five weeks instead of two days. Exactly. And people yeah. learn much better and they apply it, et cetera. So quite a lot of businesses have been also able to redefine themselves in how this works. So I think there's, there's a great opportunity here, but we need to be very strategic about that. And the companies who understand this change in behavior and changing, I say, life work balance on purpose, because it's about life balance, really. It's about how you bring in work into a life. And I think that's super important to remember. One size average um, approach doesn't, won't take you far.